Is there you know, an in Go ahead. I'm sorry, Bob. No, I, I just as um, we were talking about immunosuppression, um, that has a major effect on testing that I don't think people realize because we use immunologic tests in immunodeficient people. Um, and I think the public doesn't realize that. Perhaps uh, you guys would like to talk about that a little, just the nature of testing. Well, <laughs> well it, takes, it takes two to tango. Go ahead, Carson. Yeah, um, testing could be definitely very challenging, but you know, um, I want to remind you that in most of the medical books, um, if you open the chapters for uh, some of these infectious diseases in the introduction, it will uh, be always mentioned. Uh, first of all, it's a clinical diagnosis. Um, yeah, um, um, I guess this is uh, definitely the case for Bartonellosis. That's the case for many of the uh, uh, patients with Borrelia infection. And uh, it's also mentioned, if you are lucky, you can get confirmation by doing lab tests. Yeah, and this is exactly what it is. So I guess there's also um, uh, uh, a big widespread of uh, information uh, for the overall majority of uh, of our colleagues that they are believing 100% in the outcome of testing. And uh, this is definitely um, something uh, you don't uh, have to do because um, there's always some uncertainty with any forms of testing. So without uh, some genetic testing where you have, let's say, an outcome of 99% uh, specificity, but this is completely different for most of the other tests. There's always um, uh, uh, a false positive, uh, uh, false negative testing, and uh, this is too less considered. And uh, and you know, and uh, uh, seronegative testing of uh, of Borrelia does not exclude the presence of these uh, bacteria, uh, unfortunately. So there are many many uh, reasons which could lead to seronegativity in the testing. So. Um, uh, you have uh, you have um, um, correctly said sometimes immunosuppression can lead to a negative outcome. Yeah, uh, that's uh, that uh, that's for sure. So uh, nevertheless, uh, we need um, uh, we need uh, diagnostics, and um, uh, there are definitely some uh, legal requirements to run tests like the two tier testing, which I don't uh, like very much uh, um, uh, um, uh, with a uh, starting test. With an accuracy of 50%, you can swip a coin getting uh, the same outcome, more or less. Yeah. Um, so, um, so um, uh, it was not uh, uh, legal, but um, from a certain uh, time on, I ignored completely the ELISA testing, I have to say, in Germany, in my, uh, in my former practice and then in the clinic. Um, so with uh, um, that um, a big uncertainty um, of the outcome. So the Western blot is definitely much better. So uh, we have an accuracy, let's say, around about 80. And uh, if you have a very qualified uh, manufacturer, 90% or might be 92, uh, 92, but there's always something missing. Um, and um, um, so what I have learned over the uh, three decades now uh, being in the field is... Uh, you can um, minimize the risk of missing um, uh, uh, the infectious diseases if you choose right from the beginning different techniques. Yeah, so um, uh, you can go for the antibody testing for some uh, some infectious diseases. Sometimes you can use PCR testing or T cell spot testing, whatever it is. So, but if you use different um, uh, types of diagnostic tools, you have a much better chance um, of uh, getting the detection. Well, I think the doctors are um, treating the papers and not the patient. Yeah. It's hard to accept that with most things, the test is confirmatory and it's seen as a gold standard. <laughs> with Lyme disease, a positive test doesn't mean you have it and a negative test doesn't mean you don't have it. That should be a disclaimer on this testing, but it requires complex interpretation. It's, and I People think that that way that, and it's hard for. In what other illness can you say that that the positive test doesn't mean you have it, and negative test doesn't mean you don't have it? What other what other condition illness that we treat is that true? I think I only see that with probably this. more than probably more than we realize. Yeah, yeah probably. much more. Yeah. But for example, Epstein Barr virus. If it's positive, it doesn't mean that you have it. It means that you had it, or you have it. Exactly. I think if you if you lean for the diagnosis 
on four poles. The symptoms, the physical examination, the germs investigation, and the dysfunction of the disease. That, that will be safe. And the infection will produce an inflammation. And the inflammation will produce autoimmune uh, response. So if you treat the infection, you treat the inflammation at the same time and the autoimmune response on the same time. And the genetic, it's like a weather bulletin. 50% chance of rain tomorrow or 10% of uh, wind, that's the genetics. That doesn't work for me. So I've had many patients come to us and say, well, why are you here? Well, we have a positive test. And I say, fine. Um, and then we go through our process and we we discover all these abnormalities and the history compatible. And I said, you know, um, I usually say, you know, um, it's nice that you had a positive test mainly because it got you here, not because it is relevant. And we have no way, we have no markers that we can track this disease, like with HIV, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, et cetera, et cetera. But I'll tell you, um, yes, I do think you have an active infection based on A, B, C, D, E. And well, the test is fine. I'm glad it got you here. But that, ha that happens quite frequently because um, the public is still uh, convinced that testing is what should be done. And if it's negative, it's negative. If it's positive, it's positive. Although I have a few renegade patients who just refuse to believe any of what they're told by uh, traditional physicians in terms of uh, testing uh, outcomes. If it's positive, it will stay positive. Even if you treat it, the positivity will stay. But the thing that are not gonna stay is the symptoms, the physical examination and the dysfunction, meaning the liver, the iron, the kidneys, the autoimmune factors, that will go. But the positivity for the germs will stay forever. Yeah, this is where our, um, um, how our immune system is programmed for. Yeah? This, exact, this, exactly, exactly. Um, um, but, 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 so but, you, can't lean, yeah. you can't lean on positivity or negativity. This is one of the four uh, poles. This is not the, the main one. To start off, you need the germs investigation. When you've got it, you don't need it anymore. You need to follow the dysfunction that they disappear, the physical examination, and the symptoms. That's what must disappear, not the positivity uh, against the germs. That will stay. Now, one belief is IgM means recent infection and IgG is later. Does that make sense? But that's, that's totally a lot wrong. of people very rigidly that's adhere to that. Wrong. Wrong, wrong. Yeah. How would you explain That's, that? I think I told you yesterday. Yeah. Well, the IgM is a huge molecule. The IgG is a very little molecule. So when a germ comes into your circulation, IgM comes to defend you. But the germs have more flexibility than the IgM and come to in the endothelial cell and then in the tissue. There can only come IgG. So if you treat with antibiotic, the germs will come back into your circulation and the IgM will come back. I've got thousands and thousands of examples of that. They change from IgM to IgG, IgM, IgG. IgG is not an old infection. IgM is not a new infection. IgM and IgG follow the position of the germs in your body. That's so clear to me. I've done it thousands and thousands of times. They go from IgM to IgG, from IgG to IgM. It's part of the evolution. And another thing that's very uh, amazing is that some people do all along their disease IgM. After 10 years, they keep on IgM and other people never do IgM. That's okay. what we based know. on 20 and more thousand patients. But, you know, we see that quite often. That is what we call the IgM persistence. Uh, you have patients who have been for decades uh, presenting only IgM antibodies. So uh, my explanation is a bit different. So um, a patient uh, who are showing up all the time IgM, uh, they had been uh, probably very immunosuppressed 
uh, when um, uh, it was the time of the transmission. Yeah, uh, so there was never um, uh, a good functionality of the immune system that um, mm -hmm. uh, had the switch from IgM to uh, uh, to IgG. And uh, you know, there, there, um, there, there are some other. Uh, uh, there's some new suspicion as well that specifically IgM Borrelia could also be um, uh, caused by uh, by Bartonella. So that uh, there was some presentation. Uh, uh, of, uh, uh, yeah, there's some time. presentation. I agree. But if you look at the at the anatomical size of IgM and the anatomical size of IgG, you got the result. You've got the answer. It's not right. more complicated than that. Yeah, but I, I think I, yeah, IG, uh, IgM is um, uh, beside of the macrophage is the first immune defense. Yeah, and um, so um, IgM has a certain task to fulfill, and um, after a time, uh, when the uh, pathogens are not eradicated, our immune system uh, will respond in a different way, and this is when um, IgG antibodies come into place. Yeah. So uh, I have some doubts uh, about your uh, your hypothesis. Um, so, um, but I think the point is no, the, point, the point is that we have imperfect diagnostics. An antibody test, whether it's negative, positive, IgG or IgM, is is kind of helpful for us. You know, it get but it we make a decision about Lyme disease based on exactly what you've said. Does it fit? Was there a hi the appropriate history, the, the appropriate assessment, clinical examination, and then finally, response to treatment? That We are clinicians. We don't depend upon the IgG, the IgM, and it's not unique to have an IgM stay persistent for years. I mean, we, we get taught CMV, the IgM goes negative, by six months and you only have an IgG, toxoplasmosis, the same kind of thing. We we kind of use, totally use that, we, we use those that terminology all the time. But you see syphilis, people treated for syphilis with an IgM that stays positive for three years. It doesn't necessarily disappear at, at three months or six months. And I think similarly with Lyme, Lyme is complex. Lyme is a spirochete. People are immunosuppressed. There's lots of factors, tick factors going on that are suppressing the immune response. But if you go to the traditional laboratories in the UK, they'll say, oh, you have an IgM persistently, but you never develop an IgG. It's a false positive. So laboratory, the, the laboratory tests that are used in many places are so strict that they almost, they miss most of the Lyme cases and even the, the true Lyme cases who are antibody positive, the laboratory reads them as false positives. And then the GP says, you don't have Lyme disease because your test is negative or your test is a false positive. And they should be treating people based on clinical assessment. You, we can't depend upon the current laboratory testing because we don't have good PCRs that prove live replicating Borrelia. It's a clinical diagnosis. And we are good at that, I think, as Lyme literate physicians, but the doctors who are seeing most of the patients, the primary care doctors, are totally missing most of the cases. But you know, and this well, is the problem. The test, the test is uh, part have. of the diagnosis. The test is just a part of the diagnosis. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's just a one one fault. It doesn't it doesn't make the diagnosis. And also, you speak again about Lyme disease only. Then you you will miss it. The, the bad part of a bad diagnosis. Mm -hmm. You know, this is important that uh, we are coming together uh, like uh, today. Yeah, you know. Who, who have done the like uh, the guidelines? These are the the so called KOL exactly. experts. The guidelines. And exactly the first discussion I had in Germany was uh, two of these guys, uh, two of three 
um, who um, uh, um, uh, are still responsible for the guidelines. And when we talked about how many Lyme patients they have seen, and uh, both of them mentioned, so uh, chronic Lyme isn't existing. We have maximum seen 20 a year. So how can someone um, uh, judge about chronicity uh, who have never seen uh, 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 the same numbers as we see on a daily basis? Yeah. They're like not- the- with Collectively, how guy- many Lyme patients have the six of us seen? Many thousands. And probably a lot of the people that write some of these guidelines, collectively, the long-term care of these patients, it may be a handful. Yeah. A handful. Yes. Because there are a lot, they do one-time consults. They don't have the long-term responsibility and they don't treat people year after year decade after decade we we see these people over a period of decades yeah and, and, and i would say look at when i see patients in uk and ireland you know many of them are they, they're a gp will send a referral into infectious disease to see a patient with suspected lyme and the infectious disease doctor will refuse to see the patient they'll say oh i don't think this patient has lyme you know or they have they have the standard that oh people get two weeks of antibiotics and they just send them on their way and they never see them a second time. This is the standard of care. The infectious disease doctors that do see patients will give them a couple of weeks of antibiotics. They won't necessarily follow them up, uh, and and then if patients get better on three weeks of antibiotics and then they get worse after three weeks, on stopping it they'll say, we can't give you more antibiotics because you because the guidelines say three weeks. You know, we don't, we don't practice clinical medicine that way with any other infectious disease. You know, the guidelines are written by people that don't understand Lyme and people follow the guidelines for this infectious disease like no other infectious disease. I treat cellulitis, the guidelines say seven to 10 days. But some of my patients require four weeks of antibiotics for cellulitis. I would never stop my treatment after 10 days because the guidelines say I would stop because I clinically assessed that the antibiotics weren't necessary anymore. But with Lyme disease, we're stuck in guidelines. We limit treatments. We we treat the guidelines, not the patients. Well, the guidelines should be the patients, the patient that will tell you. We agree. We agree on that. But people are denied treatment by many doctors in UK and Ireland and all over the world because you're only allowed three weeks of treatment. And the guidelines say after three weeks, everybody is cured. And it's dangerous to treat with longer course antibiotics. And there's no evidence of benefit. This is the mantra that goes around. And this is the situation that patients are caught in very often. You know, we should listen to the patients, but these doctors are not listening to the patients. So if it's dangerous to treat more than a few weeks for Lyme disease, but yet if you have acne, oh, people give antibiotics for years. I was going to say acne. How can, how can people reconcile that disparity? Which has more disability and impairment and risk of death? Acne or these tick-borne diseases, yet there's that restriction that's quite rigid with tick-borne disease that doesn't exist with treating acne. It makes no sense to me. I'm I'm trying to understand that. I wanted to make a follow-up comment on the uh, access to care issues and about the hierarchy and um, academic medicine that's going on. So first, um, to make things even worse than has been portrayed. I have had patients who were told after they called Duke University, University of North Carolina, um, um, Bowman Gray, and so forth. Well, you know, we don't really treat Lyme disease, so I don't think we can make an appointment for you, which made me livid. I mean, when did the academicians get to pick and choose what they would treat and they don't know what the patient has in the first place they were just told by the patient i think i have lyme disease can i come there and they say no we don't treat lyme disease so they've excluded a whole population of people 
based on a horrible bias. My second point would be that I hate our medical system. I hate the fact that professors are teaching students where the professor knows nothing. And the reason they know nothing is because they don't spend time with patients. And instead of writing eight horrible articles a year to get their grants, write one good one and spend half your time in the clinic learning and challenging yourself and being challenged by your infectious disease um, fellows and residents and so forth and so on. Our, our system is totally broken. So there's no way that we can uh, break out of this um, into a new enlightened area uh, unless this system is broken down. There is a way to change the medical syllabus at university. What can we do to fix it? What can we do to get better outcomes for our patients? We know what's wrong. We know why these people, you know, we all deal with these patients that other people don't want to deal with. I think in costly, complex, chronic diseases, people don't want to deal with. But this, there's more and more of these patients. What can we do to fix it? Well, it's not a solution, but I do think that uh, what do we do, call a tick-borne illness or intracellular pathogens or some combination of that or Lyme brucellosis complex, I think it should become its own discipline. And so I, I know that there are plenty of people around the country who are of means who, if we got a coalition of physicians together, it was quite credible. And we said, okay, we have a place to build, we have a place to work, we have a, we have a, uh, we have a work product and we have a uh, work plan. I know Carson has been through this, but um, I do believe that um, this is the this is what we need to do. And I mentioned this to a number of patients. Say, oh hell yeah, you know, we definitely should have your own discipline. I said because as an infectious disease person, I can tell you I haven't seen a more complex illness in my career than Lyme brucellosis, and so it cuts across every uh, system. And you have to be a decent neurologist. You have to be a decent psych, not excellent, just decent. You have to know something about nutrition. You have to know something about infectious diseases. You have to know something about the GI tract, the, dermat the dermatologic um, uh, tract, and so forth. You have to know about everything to be a, a good clinician. And you know, that's not to say we don't listen and partner where we can to learn, but a lot of times we teach the consultant. You know, they look at it and we, we teach them. So um, there's got to be a place on earth for such a complex discipline, which is multifactorial, which is multidiscipline. I think getting spe super specialized and, and yes. algorithm medicine hurts things. So it's hard to deal with something with this complexity. Like, like when you get Lyme and COVID, you know, what, what's the interaction or, or, COVID vaccine or booster, is there some interaction there? If, what what was There's your vaccine. experience? Yeah, what did you yeah. find with the uh, boosters? You had some experience with some of your patients with the COVID boosters. Well, the, the booster contains graphene. Graphene is a huge molecule that blocks all the circulation. The spikes as well will attack the endothelium cell. So all your chronic, uh, uh, chronic germs will be reactivated. So they were maybe just carrier and now they become really ill with that. But, but getting back to the question of just the, COVID, the interaction between Lyme disease and, and COVID-19, I mean, COVID-19 is a virus that is immunosuppressive. You know, patients, the patients that we often saw sick in the intensive care unit um, with COVID-19 had lymphopenia, low lymphocyte couch, you know, and 10% and of them ended up getting viral reactivation in the intensive care unit. This is studies from Dublin. You know, they had herpes reactivation, they had VZV, chickenpox reactivation. We, in the ICU, we actually did uh, blood PCRs for CMV and EBV, some of the COVID-19 patients had reactivation of CMV by PCR, reactivation of EBV. So anyway, 
COVID-19 is an immunosuppressive virus and I follow up long COVID patients and some of them have CD4 lymphocyte counts of 200, 300, similar to many of my HIV AIDS patients, you know? So there's an ongoing immunosuppression that we're seeing with COVID-19. And I think many latent infections can reactivate and, and you know, chlamydia is a latent infection, mycoplasma is a latent infection, Lyme can be a subclinical infection, Bartonella can be a subclinical infection. So I think, I think there is the, I think we're probably going to see more reactivation of latent infections in the setting of, you know, COVID-19 induced immunosuppression. And I think Lyme is probably part of that picture. And I've had a number of Lyme patients that I thought were cured, back to work, exercising, full activity. They got COVID-19 and all of a sudden, all their Lyme symptoms came back again. And I treated them again with antibiotics and they got better. So there probably is some subclinical latent Lyme disease out there in the community. And I think when people get COVID-19, there's a high risk of reactivation of multiple viruses, multiple bacteria pathogens, including Lyme disease. I would totally yeah. agree with that. Um, of course, I would agree with that. But then uh, practitioners treat those conditions with cortisone, which help the <laughs> immune suppress. Well, well yeah, but you may be about to die from, uh, you know, fibrotic lung and multiple clots and that sort of thing. So I was going to say, um, Jack, that I agree with that, but I look at the COVID as probably the worst stressor that our Lyme population has seen, but there are many others, and they don't have to be infectious. They can just be life's trauma. They can be chemical, physical, um, emotional, um, and... They don't have to be another infection. It could be another infection. It could be another Lyme, uh, another bite. But um, I've had the same experience. Uh, destabilization of patients that were almost well and starting to get their life back and just totally destabilized. Also, people coming in or at least telling stories that sometimes about um, the fact that, uh, well, I was, you know, getting along, just feeling good most of the time, little joint pain. And I got uh, I got the booster. Well, we're talking about the vaccine now, not the actual infection, but they both create issues, uh, for perhaps for slightly different reasons. Destabilizing a large chunk of my population and bringing new patients to the clinic. So um, I'd be interested in your thoughts on long COVID, Jack. Um, well, you know, I, I would say the same thing. I, I see patients with long COVID from COVID-19, and I see people with long COVID from vaccine, COVID-19 vaccines. You know, there, there's a lot of similarities in terms of the symptomatology of patients with both. So, you know, I, I think, you know, COVID is, has, and COVID vaccination has kind of added more challenges to our work, I think. Absolutely. Because we're seeing, I think, many more cases, many more relapses, you know, um, I, I think I get, COVID has played a role in immunosuppressing the population of the world, I think, over the last three years. Cecilia, what have you seen with the COVID vaccine? I see uh, motor neuron diseases, uh, ALS, uh, death without reason, a lot of heart attack, cancer of the skin, other cancers. I see a lot of uh, uh, thromboses. Like just to say, today, in, in the clinic where my daughter works, two people died after the COVID vaccine. And then the vitamin D on the top is a killer. Uh, I don't know, I've showed the, the group of MME, the vitamin D, is the best uh, rat killer. So it, if the rat eats vitamin D3, it stoned it. So it kills it straight away. And for the COVID, everyone says take vitamin D. Well, that was a huge mistake. 
uh, it, it stops the circulation, it paralyzes the people. That's, that's also a big, uh, has a big impact in the, in the health of people. Your AOS. I have a lot of seen from the va from the booster. Sorry, you've seen AOS from the booster activation of yeah. AOS. Okay. Yes, yes. Okay. I haven't seen a lot of AOS in my lab, and suddenly there are many. And thrombosis, that's plenty, plenty. And heart attack. Young people that are healthy that die on the field on the soccer field. I've got a list of more than seventy. Uh, yeah, it's the COVID vaccine has done a lot of uh, create a lot of uh, health issue. I wonder about the Lyme vaccine. What that would be like? <laughs> where is the Lyme vaccine gone? Where where do we find that? Well, there's one that's being developed. There was one that was around for a while, and there were issues with it and lawsuits, and and then it was taken off the market. And um, exactly now there's another one coming, and it's uh, I Would don't you know. Use I, it? Not after what I saw with the prior vaccine. The prior vaccine had suicide with it. They it was based on uh, the 31 band, which was significant with neurological provoking neurological symptoms and arthritic symptoms. And the question is, would that same thing happen? Or is it a different part of the 31 ban? Or would it even work? I, I don't know. It's... Uh, I don't know, but I, I wouldn't try it. So it's still in the market. The vets are using our human vaccine, yeah? To vaccinate dogs and other animals. Horses. How how do the animals do it? Do, I guess they can't complain of brain fog. But no, yeah. no, I, just, uh, that, that, um, I haven't got any feedback. But I know um, that uh, the vaccine, um, after um, uh, it was um, uh, taken out of the market, uh, was commercialized uh, in vet medicine all over Europe. So uh, you know, uh, several docs uh, in the past thirty years, and uh, uh, all of them got uh, the Lyme vaccine because the vet recommended that very well. So. Uh, in the early days, I wasn't aware that it was only one uh, out of three strains, which are very common in Europe. So it didn't make any sense uh, to go only on uh, on one strain, the B31 strain, ignoring the, uh, the other ones, which uh, had been more common. So Garini and uh, Afseli and some uh, subtypes as well. So, um, But um, uh, the, uh, the manufacturers made a lot of money out of that. Absolutely. But I think in our days, you can't talk about Europe different than USA, different than uh, South America, different than Africa and Australia. The whole world is mixed. You can't com make compartment of diseases there and there and there. That doesn't exist anymore. Let's say for the sake of argument that uh, we do have more latent infection in the community than we realize, and of course our diagnostic Definitely. screening testing is uh, is not very good. And let's say we have that, and then we, what happened with the first trial was they picked highly uh, vulnerable so-called uh, people like who worked at the, uh, as a forest ranger and did various other things. Um, and they injected those, and most of them had DR4 positive as a, uh, um, as the HLA marker that, uh, is associated with rheumatoid arthritis sometimes and so forth and so on. And the reason for the the lawsuit was that I literally, I, and Bob, you can correct me, um, 250, 300 people developed um, polyarthritis and malaise and achiness and so forth and so on. And then Smith Klein withdrew it from the market eventually because they said it wasn't selling. And it was kept very quiet for, for very many years. And so... And also, I wonder about the um, um, inadequate approach to an illness that may, um, in a, in a sub-latent or subclinical way, um, clinically latent way, um, um, 
not recognize that babesiosis and ehrlichiosis and anaplasmosis and many of rickettsia, many other organisms are latent in the body. And, you know, you may have the risk of activating those um, if you're not careful, particularly, I believe, if somebody has uh, subclinical borreliosis. It, it just, it's not just Borrelia for Dorfri B31 strain. It's complex infection. So yeah. it might give a false sense of security. And, you know, we uh, saw in the past, I made also a bad experience with uh, two other vaccines. Um, um, uh, TDE, tick-borne encephalitis is very endemic in the uh, middle part of Europe. So specifically in the south of Germany, Switzerland, Austria, northern part of Italy and western part, uh, eastern part of France. So uh, there's a general recommendation to be vaccinated because um, there's no treatment available if you ever have uh, caught the virus. So um, so in younger patient, um, uh, uh, um, uh, it could be challenging, but uh, most of the time um, uh, you can expect a good outcome. It's a completely different story in elderly people. They are getting very serious ill. And uh, meanwhile, we have on the changes we have discussed. Um, you know, there's a huge wise, uh, widespread, so we are not dealing anymore in the middle of the okay. Um, so TBE has meanwhile arrived uh, in the Scandinavian countries, uh, has arrived um, in, uh, even in the UK, the first cases, and we will see uh, if there's a need for further vaccination. So um, the vaccine was developed in the 80s and uh, is still routinely available and fully recommended by the government uh, for uh, any people living in uh, these endemic areas. And um, um, uh, and um, so in Austria, by the way, 90% uh, of the people are vaccinated with uh, TBE. Um, in Germany, uh, we are much lower, around about 40-50% maximum, even if it is an officially recommended vaccine. And the reason for that was um, that um, uh, many people couldn't tolerate very well. So specifically in the beginning, in the 80s and the 90s, and um, this is what I've um, uh, noticed in my patient as well. So I became very cautious um, in recommending TBE vaccination in patient uh, with uh, with Lyme. So when I uh, when I was uh, aware um, of Lyme disease, um, I told my patient not to get this vaccine because almost in in a very high percentage, uh, it had caused um, uh, 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 um, uh, deterioration out of sudden. Yeah, and a uh, similar experience I made uh, around about 12 or 14 years ago when we had um, a swine flu endemic um, uh, mm -hmm. here in Europe. So this was another vaccine which caused a lot of problems. So with the other routine ones like uh, tetanus or uh, polio or whatever it is, um, so I haven't seen uh, really um, uh, uh, big problems. But with those three ones, so uh, starting with TBE, then with the spine flu, and specifically um, in some of my patients with uh, the COVID-19 vaccine, I've definitely made some bad experience. But um, uh, but we have also to take in consideration um, uh, that we are uh, that we are getting in our practices or clinics a pre-selected um, uh, audience, yeah? So um, uh, 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 people or patients approaching us, they have either um, uh, a history of Lyme or um, uh, their, uh, their GPs or specialists um, um, uh, are suggesting that they have Lyme. So probably uh, they are on a higher risk level uh, than uh, to respond uh, mm -hmm. not very well on uh, vaccinations. Right. Now it's kind of getting late, so and it's particularly in Europe there or Africa. So yeah. maybe we could just do some closing remarks that any of you would want to make to summarize what you'd want to share, having the experience that you have. Does anyone want to start in kind of doing an overview of what you would recommend anyone that would listen to this video? I guess um, maybe I'm, I will start. So, um, so one of my biggest wishes since decades is really um, that uh, we can definitely um, uh, can spread more awareness um, uh, about tick-borne diseases. And uh, my second wish uh, would be um, that um, uh, we could train much better um, in uh, in all the countries dealing with tick-borne diseases, um, uh, the doctors, so that they. Um, have uh, much better skills, much better expertise to deal um, uh, 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 in the best way uh, with patients suffering from tick-borne diseases. Okay. 
And I guess yes, that, uh, to to inform more doctors that would be the best thing to do, uh, because there's no knowledge of uh, infectious diseases everywhere in the world, and I would avoid to say that there are endemic places and epidemic places. It's everywhere in the world. I've got patients of all over the world, and it's the same the same story. It's not Africa. It's not Europe. It's not the USA. I've got them coming from everywhere, every day. So this is not true that the disease belongs to a, um, a country. This is not true at all anymore. This was confirmed by the uh, study last year, uh, published by the WHO, yeah. finally. Oh, well. So I see I, patients. Yeah. I don't read publications. So, so, you know, I guess my my comments really are that, you know, I think we need to go from bed to bedside. You know, we need to kind of span the whole spectrum of where we can impact on Lyme disease. And I established a. a a charity in Scotland called the Lyme Resource Centre. And we're focusing on signage, going out into the community, letting people know that there are ticks in Scotland because most people don't even know what a tick is. Pe most people don't know that ticks carry Borrelia and other infections. So a really important concept is just getting the word out there, signage all over the world that there are ticks in your community. So that's number one. And then number two is GP education or pharmacy education. Get people to understand what a bullseye rash is. You know, if if a pharmacist identifies a bullseye rash, if a GP identifies it, or even if you don't see a bullseye rash, we need education and primary care. And that will get most of the cases of Lyme disease. Now, we as clinicians treating chronic Lyme, you know, we have another agenda. We're dealing with complex patients, but we don't have very good science behind what we're doing because there is no funding because nobody recognizes who are in positions of, you know, power who can give grants out to infectious disease people. We don't have good funding for Lyme disease. We need to start getting good funding and good science. And that's going to be a huge challenge because we as clinicians taking care of complex patients, we know what the issues are intuitively, but we'd like to have the studies and the research and the money and the funding to support, you know, what we clinically suspect. So I think there's a huge range of challenges with Lyme disease from complex disease and funding to support the science to people in the world understanding that ticks are everywhere and there are things you can do to prevent tick bites, to get them off safely, to early diagnose people. Patients have responsibility. GPs have responsibility. We have, have to put a lot of energy into so many different areas of the whole spectrum of Lyme disease and, and vector-borne infections in general. I think that in the 80s, the knowledge of those diseases was better than now. Mm. Yes. Mm -hmm. When I go back to the papers of my father and colleagues, it's clear. It's simple. It's a vascular disease that uh, make a like a sponge situation in every organ, and it's not that complicated. It's of course multifactorial, but you deal with the main one and you get there. So um, this is a call to action that's 40 years old and withering. And when I look at uh, some of the uh, papers that were done in the 90s by um, scientists, they were pretty good. They identified the spirochete, they identif identified uh, the mechanisms for escape and, and immune evasion and that sort of thing. They're yeah. pretty good. And the clinical- It was much more advanced than now, yeah. The clinical trials that came after that, which were uh, inspired by, you know, the Lyme Rix vaccine, by the way, with idea safe folks. And there's only about eight of them at the time. And 
they were in a little click. And so, you know, if they know something that the other 8,000 IDSA people didn't know, the IDSA people said, oh, you know, it was kind of like, we can do no wrong. We're going to listen to these guys because they're the experts. And there we go. And we go back to the point that these guys who wrote the guidelines know nothing about how to treat a patient. Nothing. And so we need to have a new uh, paradigm, which um, will require funding. So we're going to have to have a, 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 a white angel, a white horse, whatever. And, uh, and you know, collect a number of people that uh, um, can be trusted. And then I think that if we had a plausible um, work plan that was presented in an intelligent way by people who know how to do that, we would get support because there's a lot of people, not just us, that want to see this resolved because how many hundreds of thousands of people have, have had their lives damaged and changed by this? So it's becoming more and more imperative and it's becoming more and more shameful uh, to the population here in the U.S. for sure. And uh, I can't speak for around the world, but I'm sure it's very similar. Absolutely. There's no defense. Rosalie? Look, I agree with all these things. We need better studies. We need education of the public and education of our physicians. And there are so many questions, and we all have the same questions, pretty much. And it's interesting, because we all kind of have the same approach to answers. Education. And education of those involved with medical decisions which is sorely lacking in, in too many countries. And this denial about how sick our population is and mental health uh, throughout the world, I mean, has, um, has been a real problem. I mean, suicide rates in kids and adolescents have escalated. It's not just limited to the US. And, you know, there are changes that immunologically that occur in those that kill themselves. And we've seen Lyme from Brian Fallon's study. If you look at his study very carefully, you'll see that the kids were really affected in terms of uh, mood disorders and suicidality. And I think America and the rest of the world has to wake up. This is supposedly our future. Well, they're not doing so great. And, and we really owe it to them to educate the public, educate our physicians, and get better science out there to help people, plain and simple. I, I was trained in the 70s in psychiatry, and that was psychodynamic Freudian theories. And when I was being trained 50 years ago, the last thing I would ever have anticipated is that I'd be sitting here now talking about tick-borne disease causing mental illness. That, that just was beyond comprehension. But And I started seeing all these cases, and they said, well, this patient was cured because they had a month of antibiotic. And uh, I'd see one after another, and I wasn't looking for it, but they kept finding me, and I, I they were everywhere. And I would see the suicidal cases. I would see the the violence cases, the homicides, the autism, the disabilities, the mental illness, drug abuse. And once you see it and you, you recognize it, you can't stop seeing it. And it seems overwhelming. And then I would talk, I would talk to my colleagues and I say, listen, I'm seeing this. Am I imagining this? Are you seeing this? So I met with other psychiatrists and other psychiatrists said, yeah, we're seeing it too. And uh, then I met internationally with other people, and I heard the same story. So it's not just a local thing. It's global. It's a global problem that somehow the world is blind to. And it, it's rather frustrating that our weapon technology is so much more advanced than our health and our mental health care technology. Uh, that's, that's not good. And uh, we need to catch up and we have scientific capability, but it's not being really employed here. Think of it like the way you react to an airplane crash. And this is like an airplane crash. 
this pandemic and you mobilize and you look what exactly is the cause of this problem, understand it, what can we do to fix it? We need that approach towards these tick-borne diseases. But, I, you know, I thank everyone for sharing and I look forward to us sharing this with other people. And uh, thanks for your time. And I, I appreciate everything. And let's hope that this helps people. And I think we have, but we have a lot further to go.